Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody, welcome back. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. Yeah, you were just listening to another version of the Dr. Pat show. It's called Power Up with Dr. Pat. Today, I am really thrilled about this show. I have a very special guest. Brittany Miles is joining me here today. The life you save may be your own. Mm -hmm. You know, isn't it interesting? We were just talking about that. For those of Mm -hmm. you out there, let me just tell you a little bit. Um, about Brittany, but you're going to hear a lot more about Brittany. When you look at Brittany's life, you know, a career in technology, right? Fortune 100 companies, you know, you go on that journey, as many of you've heard me talk about with my corporate career. And then somehow, it's not necessarily a light bulb, but something happens. And you start to question things. Then you question them to the point where you're looking for answers. Then you go to the point where you're looking for answers that are in places that you're not going to find them. But when you discover the universe and how it works and can guide you, then it leads you to the path that you've dreamt about. Brittany is a spiritual life coach. She hosts her own show. She's a healer. She's a speaker. She's an author. Um, And Today, she's taking on this topic um, about all of us have the ability to save the life. And the life that you save may be your own. Brittany, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Pat. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And yes, we do have the power to heal our lives once we figure out that uh, we can't change something unless we face it. And yes. sometimes we figure it out or sometimes like in my experience, the universe brings it to you. Yeah. You know, here's what I love about this, because you're going to talk about, you know, what you learned, what you discover, and now what you teach people, you mm-hmm. know, in the three-step process. I, I don't know about you, but I am pretty sure that the universe, God, spirit, whatever you believe in, I, I'm pretty sure that they were trying to get me a message back in 1973 (laughs) (laughs) and I heard a piece of it but I I just wasn't there you know tell me about you Mm -hmm. you know what was your awakening like did you get the message the first time or did you have to get a little nudge in here well I think I as Eon Levantin calls it spiritual special ed Um, so I had to hear it a couple of times so the message was very blatant for me probably throughout my 40s, so that's the 2010s. Towards the end of my 40s was 2016, where everything shattered. Couldn't find a job, lost my house, lost family, lost friends, and all I had left was surrender. That's all the universe was asking of me, was to let go. Mm. That is the hardest thing for any of us to do because we wanna hold on to, well, like I'm a director, right? I'm, I work in a Fortune 100 company. I have an Audi, right? I have a nice house in a nice suburb. It, I have a cul-de-sac, right? right. <laughs> I have a 401k. And once you let that outer adornment, that garment that you wear for the outside world, once that goes, that's the veil. And we've talked about that before. And that's what happened for me is that you realize all of that was an illusion, And for those matrix folks, um, I I never saw it, but I know it's the red or blue pill. I don't know which one it is, but taking the one where you lose the illusion and you actually see the world as it is. And it's fascinating that life is a heck of a lot simpler once you get into surrender because you don't have to do anything, right? Nothing you have to do. And that worked well for me. I 
think up until about 2018. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a year and a half, <laughs> two years. Got a new job, making, you know, a lot of money. Um, again, back in corporate America, you know, new, new great apartment, new car, you know, just life was going well. We were traveling again. And then boom, my daughter was diagnosed. Um, and I'm allowed to share, I asked her, um, with a, a major depressive disorder and um, psychosis. And she was 11 years old. Wow. Yeah. And we were just talking about Kanye and yeah. have, yeah. And just having to surrender. And as a parent, I wanted to do everything, everything. It was all hands on deck. I was like, what do I have to do? Who do I have to see? What has to happen? And she re- had strong school refusal. And then, so I spent most of 20, no, not even most, all of 2019 at home taking care of her. And mm-hmm. I left my corporate job again and I had to surrender to the fact that I had no control over this and I just had to go with the flow. And it got very serious with her where I had to make a difficult choice to hospitalize her. And no one wants to hospitalize their 11 year old. I know, um, but I, I, I think the wonderful folks um, at the hospital that were great to her and helped our family a lot. But through that process, again, I had to surrender and help her father to understand there's only so much we can do. Yeah. And it's been hard. Yeah. And, you know, there's sometimes that, and now more often than not, actually, Brittany, more often than not in the world we live in today, we're finding our young people, our children, our grandchildren are going through some things that either we didn't know existed right? Mm -hmm. When we were younger, or we didn't know how to talk about them. Um, Mm -hmm. Even if you look at the rate of autism in kids today, you know, it used to be, I remember doing a show where we were watching the statistics change. But now we're in a world now, when you look at a young person, you have to ask yourselves, what have we gone through here as a country? How are our children different? You know, we completely lost a generation of kids after Mm 9-11. We never talked about what the trauma was. You know, the levels of terrorism. You know, I had a story of a a, a young, young girl walked in her church one day to receive a special certificate. And as she was walking in her church, she heard a loud sound. And it was enough to put her over the edge. But the thing that you said I want to get back to is you sought out help. Mm -hmm. That right there, if that is something that we can do as parents and grandparents, that's the best way to say, I don't know what I don't know about this, but I'm going to get you some help. Yeah. Yeah. And we were fortunate that we were able to get her some of the best care that you could. And I am appreciative and I'm glad that I was able to do that. But before she got sick, I was so in that illusion again of everything's fine. Everything's great. We're just going to get through this. I had put her in a new school and everything was going to be great. And I watched her, you know, slowly then quickly fall apart. And again, that's when the illusion fell apart, right? I had to let go of, this isn't going the way that I wanted to. I had to let go of, well, you know, I'm going to be super mom again. And I got to a place where I just cried because I didn't know what to do. Um, You are taught how to mother by the woman that mothered you or women that mothered you. And we didn't have anything. We just didn't have a place for this. I, I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that really leads to, you know, part of what we're going to share to today. You know, I, I thought for me growing up as a kid and having the experiences that I had, the spiritual experiences that I had and getting really, really turned off 
by mm-hmm. the religious community I was part of for a lot of reasons. I didn't know that there would be something that I would find decades later that would support my beliefs, mm-hmm. that would support my way of life, mm-hmm. that would honor who I was in the world and how I was in the world. I didn't know I would find that. Mm-hmm. I think that we're at a place now, especially where you and I live, you know, we live in what's been classified as one of the most spiritual places on the planet and one of the least religious. Yes. And people get confused by that. Mm-hmm. But when you're in search for a solution, a solution, sometimes things happen we don't expect, right? Yeah. I agree. That's what I've been calling this entire awakening that I've been going through. Um, I call it accidental Buddhism, where had I, did I read about Buddhism? Did I know about it? Of course. Did I follow most of the mindful practices? Not so much, right? That I thought they were great. And I had the books by my bedside. And through this three-step process, I rediscovered Buddhism, so I call it accidental Buddhism. Well, let's talk about that when we come back, because I'll tell you what, Mm -hmm. I discovered it through a pop culture movie. And when we come back, let's talk about the accidental nature of spirit. But man, you better be awake enough to know that it's trying to get to you. Let's take a short break. When we come back, Brittany's going to talk about what she discovered, how she discovered it, what is accidental Buddhism, and how does it help us? How will it help us get through whatever it is that's in front of you? And I'll make sure that you have lots of information about Brittany, also where she's going to be, what she's going to be doing. But we're going to take a short break, everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. I know it's the life you save may be your own. My special guest today is Brittany Miles. And that song is the key Mm -hmm. to one of the things that got my attention about my spiritual journey. But we're going to hear from Brittany about hers. What is the accidental accidental Buddhism? But before we do that, Brittany, let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things you've got going on, especially when we think about some of the events at East West Books. Sure. I've got a class coming up next Wednesday, 729, 5 p.m. Pacific. It's going to be a Zoom class. Uh, It's called The Life You Save May Be Your Own, talking about that three-step process that got my life back together um, in 2016. We're going to touch upon that a little bit today. So if you're interested, you can reserve at eastwestbookshop.com. Tickets are $30. I love it. Um, And for those of you, you can go on over there and check it out, eastwestbookshop.com. And it is, and please remind everybody of the date. It's the 27th, isn't it? No, it is 729. 29. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Go over there and take a look at it. Sign up because this is true right now. The life you'll, the life you save may be your own and you have to do that first. Really, isn't that one of the lessons that we're going to talk about? You're going to walk us through what accidental Buddhism is, but Mm -hmm. isn't one of the lessons that we learn in life, Brittany, is, man, we've got to be the first ones up at bat. We've got to take, we got to figure out how to get ourselves some help, right? Mm -hmm. You got to put your own oxygen mask on too, um, before you can help anyone else. And that's what I did with my daughter. I put mine on, I got in and I got some help for myself and support. And then I was able and better equipped to help her. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the accidental part of that song was at the tail end of that movie with the most fantastic Angela Bassett. I mean, I Mm -hmm. watch anything she's in. Um, But when the tail end of the movie, you find out how she accidentally, but out of desperation, found her spiritual path. And who are we talking about? We're talking about Tina Turner. Mm -hmm. Um, Are there accidents for real? I do not believe there are any accidents. I believe in synchronicity with one breath, with one flow. (laughs) You will know synchronicity for my police fans. Um, 
you're supposed to find certain things people are put on your path like you were put on my path with the show something I didn't know anything about and there are no accidents so for me the accidental Buddhism was basically like we've been saying it's just taking the veil of illusion away and seeing what is and that is one of the most powerful things that will happen in your life and it's one of the scariest things that will happen in your life tell us about the scary part because people don't realize mm -hmm. that but but that is so true right Mm -hmm. tell us about that a little bit because i had the same sense of it myself it was not quite like the movie right we didn't really see what happened after that in a sense um well, tell us a little bit about the scary part. The scary part prior to the awakening was waking up in fear every day. Yeah. Um, terrified that you actually had to get up out of bed and out of the house and go off and do things. And you didn't know how things were going to go because you had a lack of control. The scary part then was finding the will to put on the mask to go outside. The scary part after was that you didn't need the mask and you start to question what the mask actually represents or represented. Um, What were all of those things that were important to you? What are all of those things mean to you? Where did you actually accumulate all of those things, right? Where did all those belief systems come from? And that's the scary part because At that point in time, you're starting to realize lots of things in your life were on autopilot, auto magic, and you just accept them. And you now have the opportunity to choose them or reject them or find something new. Mm -hmm. And that opens up a whole new vista that people didn't know existed. And that's scary to take that step forward. It is. And, you know, that's why I think you teach it, too, is because, you know, we will take on new things in life, Brittany, right? We're going to take them on. And sometimes people think when they see us here doing this show or on Facebook or, Mm -hmm. you know, doing some live streaming or speaking, sometimes they think, wow, you know, there they are. They're doing their thing. I can't tell you how many times I still to this day get butterflies when Mm -hmm. I am coming out and speaking or you're the same, you're doing that, but there's an aspect of us that will not go quietly into the night. Mm -hmm. And that's the part we need to figure out how to help. That's the part that you help. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I have to do it for myself on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. I have lots of things going on and I'm, you know, a bit stressed and I had to stop, take a breath, get myself centered and grounded. And I was like, okay, this is what you're teaching people. So, you know, you need to live it. Um, But I agree with you. It is when you're living your life on purpose, it's a wonderful thing. And right now I feel like I have entered my purpose, but it's also a really scary thing because I don't have any real control. It, I have the appearance of control of making certain moves forward, making certain types of decisions. But overall, I'm on a new journey that I've never thought I'd be on and is vastly different than the journey that I was taught that I was going to be on. Mm-hmm. At this point in my life at 53, I'm supposed to be looking at retirement communities for 55 and over, right? Mm-hmm. In theory, I'm supposed to have an adult child. In theory, I'm supposed to potentially be a grandmother. None of those things are true. I'm living a life that actually terrifies people because I'm making choices that make me happy and I'm not living the status quo. And sometimes that makes you an enemy of people that you love and friends and employers because you're not falling in line. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the number one thing that will cause people to look up even if we don't think they're paying attention to our lives Mm -hmm. when we, and this is, look, I know people have said something similar to you, man, she's like off the beaten path. She's like, I mean, like, where is she going now? Like, 
what is this? Is she really okay? Should we do an intervention? <laughs> yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and do you find, uh, it's hard to find the words that our friends will understand. Um, mm -hmm. And yet we keep trying, but that's not where the message is, right? You know, in the accidental, uh, in accidental Buddhism, right? We're looking for the, let's just call it for lack of a better word, we're looking for the, the message in the process that you teach. We're looking mm -hmm. to get some level of clarity or something. And it's hard to describe because mm -hmm. everybody's different. Right. I see images. And if I see an image, I know what the image is telling me to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yet I cannot get that information because it's like the poltergeist movie when the screen in poltergeist gets all like fuzzy and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, it's that, that you cannot see your future. So talk a little bit about from that point on, you created a three-step process mm -hmm. and you're going to be teaching this too at East West. Tell us a little bit about how you got from there to discovering the process. Well, the process came to me as I needed it. When I was having great depression, well, in 2016, I was under a great stress, obviously. So I was highly depressed and had great anxiety, right? And those are things that I have been diagnosed with. And I really didn't have any money for medicine at the time. So I am pretty much white knuckling it. I say I came up with it when I was on I-405 <laughs> And I was driving home and I had that time in bumper to bumper traffic to let my mind run, let the ego run about what's this going to be, you know, the whole like, let's go off into fairyland. And I decided that I would only focus on what was in front of me, what was happening in that moment. So I called it picture frame. Right. So for me, it was what could I see out of my, you know, out of my window and what could I focus on? And I gave myself one thing to focus on. And I just sat there and I just kept trying to breathe because I felt like I couldn't breathe the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I tried to slow myself down and to slow myself down so that I didn't hyperventilate. And then once I was there, I was able to calmly and rationally be like, it's okay allow that part of myself that knew everything was fine to say it's okay and that voice was as some people call your higher self your intuition whatever like whatever you want spirit yeah. Yeah. once i was able to use those three steps to get to a place of surrender to like the present moment and calm i was able to make different choices yeah. You know what it reminds me of? And I, I want to take a short break here, but it reminds me of a little story for me. So back in the day, I, I've always participated in sports. What, it doesn't matter what it is, softball, table tennis, the whole thing, right? But I had to be in pretty good shape. And I remembered that it was always like tearing something in my knee. I tore my first big tear when I was 19. And then from that point on. And so I remember being, um, what do you call it? In incapacitated, not being able to like run or move or any of that. And so I was in the gym one day and uh, limped my way in there. And all I could do was really, you know, sit, grab a couple of really light weights. But I didn't just grab them and do them slowly, right? Intuitively, I knew to take the little teeny weights and go really, really fast, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in a gym with muscle builders, with my little teeny weights going like crazy, people want to walk up to you and say to you, dude, that's like not the way you do it. Mm -hmm. And here's what I know about that. That's just one example of how, for me, that intuitive action. Now, today, the study that just came out yesterday says that that particular thing, right? For the, of course, it's they say for people, people that are a little bit older, they say that particular thing of sitting down and doing those fast totally improves cardio. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And it's one example in life that people go through every day. It's one commonsensical example that we do in our lives every day and don't mark it down and yep. listen to outside people tell us it's not the way to do it. When we come back, we're going to talk with Brittany about how many times she's been told not to do it that way. And what does this, <laughs> what does this three-step process, what door will that open for us? And what's okay with okay? We'll be right back. That's what I'm talking about. One way or another, that's the way mm-hmm. you got to roll here. You know, I could see spirit, God, talking that song, Buddha, Allah, uh, mm-hmm. Ba'aula. I could see any one of them saying one way or another, I'm going to get you. I'm yes. going to get you. <laughs> one way or the other, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And then nine times out of 10, they're trying, they're trying, they're trying. And we are so like off in our own world, right? Whoa. Uh, Brittany, before we talk about deep dive into um, what I considered for myself one of the hardest things to do and what I absolutely rely on today, uh, breath and presence, before we do that, again, please mention how people can work with you directly, um, but also how they can kind of like get up close and personal with you over there at East West. Sure. So next Wednesday, 729 at 5 p.m. Pacific, hosting a Zoom class called The Life You Save May Be Your Own about my three-step process that got me back from the brink in 2016. And I consider it to be my signature teaching and you can get a feel for me there. And if you want to work with me one-on-one, go to miles2gocoaching.com, please. And I have an Instagram, but difficult to find, but Go to the website to get there. <laughs> yeah. And it's miles to go. So it's like miles, the number two go. Um, Correct. Okay. I know you're going to get into more detail at East West about this, but one of the hardest things I think for people to do, Brittany, is to really understand the power of breath and mm-hmm. the power of presence and what happens in breath. And that's mm-hmm. part of what you help people understand. But when mm-hmm. you put breath and presence together. For me, it's been one of the hardest things for me to do and one of the most powerful. Mm -hmm. It is. And my last episode with Brittany Dior Wilson, we were talking about this. Um, It was called The Great Unraveling, if you want to check that out. And she had a similar awakening in 2017, and she found a breath work. And we were talking about it as the breath as one of the most powerful healing sources and resources that you have in your life. You come into this world and what's the first thing that you do? Breathe. Yeah. Right. Which is pretty powerful. And that's how we know that you're alive. Right. We have to hear that ah, coming from you. Otherwise there's a lot of concern because you, you, you're not breathing. And Over time, as a child, we know how to use our breath to cry, to get what we want, or to just have fun with our friends. But as we get older, we learn how to hold our breath because we're waiting on something. We're internalizing anger. We're internalizing anxiety. And all that pressure builds up to the point where we're locked in ourselves. Um it's like we're dead from the, you know, from the neck down because we're so in our head. Like we we're not even allowing ourselves that one resource that we all have and share is like the ability to breathe. And what I realized through my path is that once I allowed myself to actually fully inhale and exhale and just let it go. And it's not the whole yogic breath. I mean, just letting myself breathe and acknowledging like, wow, I wasn't really breathing there. Then it's letting that jaw go, letting the tongue relax and loosen. The shoulders come down, able to expand the rib cage, pull that breath into the belly and back. And once you have a few cycles, you'll notice that you do have that relaxation in the body and then your mind can open up and expand. Because if you're sitting in traffic like this, and then you take a few breaths. You're like, oh, my exit is coming up. Yeah. I, I did this yesterday. Uh, I Can I share? 
I was getting ready for the show. And so I was looking at what we were going to talk about here. So I was reminded about it and what you do. And I had a scenario and this is for real. This is her for real story. You know, from day one, I've been out of the gate saying to gig workers and everyone out there file for your PPP file, file for unemployment. You know, it's going to take them some time. And now we're starting to see that there have been some gig workers and 1099 people that have not been able to collect not a single dime from unemployment because the systems haven't caught up. Right. And I remember, you know, out there trying to help somebody yesterday. And then um, my bank sends me a letter about some paperwork that I didn't fill out right for a PPP. Mm-hmm. Now, I've got a lot of tools at my, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Sometimes it's breathing. Sometimes it's meditation. Sometimes it's uh, Pink Floyd. I got a lot of (laughs) tools. I got a lot of tools. Dark side. Dark side is what I was listening to yesterday. But as I was getting ready for today, I remember you talking about breath. So here's what happened to me. I looked at this email from my bank. I'm a little bit annoyed at my bank to begin with because no matter how many times they told me I wasn't doing something right, there's nobody that will talk to me to help me explain how I do this differently Mm -hmm. due to the way we operate here. Nobody. 700 times I tried to dial the only number I had. So I was, I was, my, my vision was blurred. How blurred does our vision get when we're under that kind of stress? Not to mention, I'm trying to help somebody else just fill out the PPP and the unemployment. But how Mm -hmm. blurred does it get? It gets so blurred that on the form for the 999th time, they're asking me for a 941, which we do not fill out, have never filled it out, filled it out. But I, there was another box checked. And it said, you have to provide us with the salaries you paid Mm -hmm. from February 14th of 20 to February 29th of 20, or you're in violation and you may not get your loan in the loan forget, you may not be forgiven. All I could see was, what do you think I could see in that thing from my bank, Bank of America? What do you think I could see in that message? I'm not doing it right. I'm not I, going to, I, and I'm not, and you're not going to forgive, right? Mm-hmm. I was one of the first people to file, did it wrong because I couldn't get a call back, did it again the second time, and I filled out some forms just to fill them out, but I missed the dates, mm-hmm. February 14th through February of 29th. I missed those dates because they didn't make any sense to me. Why would you want those dates? I've sent you information in on every single other thing you've asked for. Tax Mm -hmm. returns. I've sent at why that, and I missed it. And then Mm -hmm. I was getting ready for the show and I remember the breathing. Mm -hmm. That's when I actually saw that they didn't want information 2014, 19, to 2029 or whatever that said, Mm -hmm. they literally needed two weeks of what I paid people. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it. Yep. Then to top it off, I'm going to, I'm going to end with this right here. (laughs) I don't know how other people are doing it through this, Brittany. I mean, I hope you're helping people get Mm -hmm. through this. I I don't know how they're doing it. I have a lot of tools. I have a great team. But even with all of that, you're thinking now, okay, this is the information I need. But they're not going to take that information in the way you work. You have to do it by doing some kind of payroll form or into it or something. I just wondered after looking at this and I emailed them back and I said, I got a spreadsheet. I download everything. Can you take, how are other people getting through it? And people don't have the tools that you and I are talking about today. Mm -hmm. Yep. I have Linda and I have Jessica and I (laughs) do a lot of things. A lot of people can't, but Mm -hmm. my heart, 
I just, I had a moment where I just broke down in tears yesterday. And I said, oh my God, how are people getting through it? And, you know, I, I talked to somebody later, Brittany, and they said, we're just not filing. I mean, is that the answer when we can't get through things, Brittany? We just don't do them. I would say no. There's always a place to go for help and trying to reach out for that help. And that's, again, one of the things that I learned by coming to the stillness after you calm yourself down, you have the ability to think in a different way. Your mind is cleared, like your, your mind cleared. I mean, crying is good. Whatever it takes to get to that place, right? You've had that stillness to process the information and your feelings, and then you can make another choice. And sometimes that choice is asking for help. That's yeah. what I did with the foreclosure mouse. I was trying to do it all. And then I thought, well, maybe I should reach out to a lawyer. Actually, a friend said to me, do you, don't you have a lawyer? Can't you find one? I was like, oh, 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 yeah. And I thought things were so horrible and, you know, couldn't be fixed. And she was like, no, we're just going to stick it to the man. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. Right. Yeah. Do you want to take calls from the people? Tell them to call me. Okay. That's it. Paperwork you get, yeah, file it. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of everything. And once I had that, I was like, oh, I'm glad that I asked. And the same way with you. It's like, well, I'm, I'm glad that I asked. And you're supporting people through this. And I understand that whole PPE process. P, uh, P, P, P. Oh. It's, it's bad. I've, I've been looking at some business loans and it's not easy. I know, but I'm a master at it now. I mean, you know, a friend of mine said, why don't you do like an online course about it? And I said, you know, that's a really good idea. Do mm -hmm. something virtual because it does look daunting. And you're not going to have all of the same forms that people that operate a corporate 100, a Fortune 100 company have. You're not going to. And what I realized is you just have to upload it. But how do how would you describe the times we're living in? And let's go ahead and skip the break because I want to make sure we're sure. talking about this next thing that you reference. And that is this idea of practicing stillness. And, 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 and the reason I think this is important, you know how my, I taught my day off though yesterday with this? <laughs> so that, that's one thing, right? So I went through that. But I had to go to the bank and I had to do a good thing at the bank. And I walk in the bank and not a lot of people there, but sometimes it doesn't, the thing that sets you off isn't always the thing that you think would set you off, right? Right. Right. It's, it's not necessarily the person that cut you off or maybe, maybe the person that cuts your grass, cuts your grass too low, right? Or it, that's not the thing. It's going to be something like, oh my gosh, honey, for the fifth time, you have cooked my eggs and you have cracked my yolk. That may put you right over the edge, right? Yes. But here's what happened to me yesterday. And again, mm -hmm. I thought about you, mm -hmm. but I think too late. I go to my bank and I'm filling out everything and I'm using their pens and I didn't have I forgot to bring in my little sanitizer, right? Hand sanitizer, because I just thought it's a bank. Right. It's going to have it all over, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to walk in. It's going to be over here by the pens. Nowhere. And I, <laughs> oh my God. And I walk up all the way around. And they're the behind the counter and they got gloves on and they're doing whatever they're doing and they're handing you stuff. And I said, Hey, like you're out of sanitizer. And he says to me, no, we're not. We're not putting it out. I said, Oh, like you're like one of the largest banks in the world and you're not putting out hand sanitizer. I said, is it that you don't believe in hand sanitizer? Cause here I go off now. I'm like, maybe they don't believe in hand sanitizer. Maybe they don't believe in masks. And it's just like, I had a whole story. Mm -hmm. And so I said, like, dude, like people, hand sanitizers, okay? Or a tissue, do you have a tissue, right? I said, why don't you have hand sand? I mean, honestly, my transaction took 15 seconds. My dialogue with this guy about hand sanitizer took a good 10 minutes. <laughs> and, and 
And he said, well, here's the deal. We were putting it out and people were taking it. Oh, yeah. And I said, come on, you are one of the largest banks in the world. You can get big bottles of hand sanitizer that people can't take out. And out of all of the things in my day, out of everything that I had gone through and done, I had that moment. And so my question to you is, we never know, do we, when that moment comes? I would like you to talk a little bit about what you've developed to help us in moments that don't show up like that, but in moments that do. I think it's always taking it back to the breath, right? Because what you were talking about was the story that you had in your head about your bank and hand sanitizer and how they should have bottles and <laughs> where it should be. Maybe it should be chained down what's going on with the mass, you know, why there are no, you know, what have you, right? You had a whole- Oh, I went story. off. <laughs> oh, okay. I did, I did. You, you had a whole little moment, which they were like, yes, yes, I got you, ma'am. Thank you, have a great day. <laughs> but in those moments, when you realize that you have a story, because I still do too, like at the store, someone's going really slow and it's, like, why didn't you have all your stuff together? Why, why are we seeing like 50 gazillion coupons now? Why, why do we need a price check? And you're like, really? But I don't know what that person's story is. I don't know what's going on with them for the day. Maybe this is something that needs to happen for them in that moment, which has absolutely nothing to do with me. Most of the things that happen in our lives, we're focused on all everybody else except for ourselves. Like you were really minding the bank's business. I was. It's, yeah. And it's letting go of those stories. And how you let go of those stories is going through taking the breath, getting into the present moment of like, what am I here to do? And why, you know, let me continue on. And in that stillness, ooh, I got a story going on. Maybe I should let that story go. Right. Yeah. Or ooh, what's going on inside of me that I need to look into and check into right? Why am I sending this outward? I think I'm doing a good thing, which is, it is, but is this about them or is this about me? Yeah. Isn't that the key though? Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I just gave you a very, every average everyday story um, mm -hmm. about something about my day got me to the point where when I got to the bank, I was, I didn't, I should have brought my own hand sanitizer, which I do. I mean, I carry it everywhere with me. Mm -hmm. I carry my sand, but I didn't because I figured it is the bank. It's one of the largest banks in the world. Mm -hmm. And I just thought I'm just going to be able to hit it up in there. But mm -hmm. we have to get back to the basics of what you're mm -hmm. talking about because it will work every time. Right. And so I'd love for you to just walk folks through um, what that three-step process is, just in summary, to remind us that this is something we can learn. And by the way, and more importantly, we can actually do. Sure. It's taking a moment to take a deep breath. When you find yourself under distress and you don't know where to go, whether to turn left or to turn right, you feel your shoulders up and you just feel that angst like you did about that hand sanitizer, your body is starting to constrict. I don't know if you felt that, but there's something happening viscerally for you and your body. But by taking those breaths, kind of clears that energy out like an eraser and you're able to focus. And once your mind is calm, you are now in the present moment where you can sit and say, wow, I'm in the bank. I'm just here to do what I need to do. Okay, they don't have hand sanitizer. Okay, that's fine. And then after that, you can sit with some of the in stillness with some of your feelings about that. Well, wow, I'm not happy about that. Largest bank in the world, they should have hand sanitizer. Yeah, that was my story. Okay. And within that stillness, you can realize I had an expectation and that expectation wasn't met, which then left, you know, left me in a place of suffering, right? That's what the Buddha taught, 
taught, it's like, if you have non-attachment to things, you'll feel free, right? Yeah. But if you have the attachment, you're going to suffer and you did suffer, right? But in that stillness, that's where you can start thinking through all of your choices about your experience and then how you want to react to your experience. And I'll tell you what, Brittany, that's why this is important conversation with you today, as well as the work you're going to be doing at East West Books. I mean, mm -hmm. this is really the conversation about having these tools at our fingertips, because I don't think I'm alone. Mm -mm. Um, I don't think I'm alone. I, I think that we are all in a different level of awareness, right? Some people more than others, I will admit that. Um, but we're at this point now where if we're not going to, you know, figure out how to manage our day to day lives in this new normal, new paradigm, mm -hmm. then we need some other tools. And that's what your three step process is about. Yes. Yes, it is. It is definitely helpful for COVID when everybody's on edge and just taking a step back to breathe, get yeah. still and just focus on the next step. We're all in this together and we can make it easier on ourselves if we just take a moment and slow it down, bring it down a thousand. Yeah. It's like my friend said to me, my friend said to me yesterday when I was kind of going through my day, my friend said to me, come on, Pat, you know, look, this is not an episode of Snowpiercer. And I'm mm -hmm. like, seriously, did you like quote a pop culture, like limited series that's on television? Did you just use that on me? And it got my attention so that I went to actually watch the final episodes of that. But the point is this, we are in charge of the episodes of our life for the most part, mm -hmm. and at least how we respond to it. Thank you for today. Thank you for all that you do. Please take a moment here. I'd love to know your personal message, but also please tell folks how they can connect with you directly. Sure. You can work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Go to miles number two, gocoaching.com. I have various packages and I would love to work with folks. And then again, next week, uh, 729, 5 p.m. Pacific, I'm going to be at East West Books talking about the life you save will be your own and you can reserve at eastwestbookshop.com. I love it. Uh, mm -hmm. Personal message, what would you like to leave us with? Breathe. Just breathe. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Brittany Miles, everybody. I'm Dr. Pat. I want to thank you for tuning us in and turning us on. Uh, and so Brittany, I didn't tell you, they also didn't have the drive through operating at the bank. So that really did set me off. <laughs> if you really want to know the truth about it. I mean, it's like hand sanitizer, no hand sanitizers, no drive through. Seriously, I got to like walk in here. I just That's got a message from one of my folks said, Pat, you know, you could take a picture on your phone. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Brittany. Brittany Miles, I'm Dr. Pat. Stay tuned for another hour on Transformation Talk Radio. We'll see you next time. Thank you.